started. Yeah. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the class we are about to have. Haru, we thank you that you have set us apart. We thank you that uh, you have made us righteous and you are helping us to be holy each and every day. Uh, you help us to sanctify us through your word. We thank you for your word that cleanses us. We thank you for your blood that cleanses us. God, as, as we are learning more about the holiness, help us to uh, live a life that reflects you, Lord, so that when people look at you, they will know that you are God and they can see that see your love and your wisdom and your guidance through us, Jesus. I give all my classmates into your hands. Uh, give us a good Wi-Fi connection throughout the sessions. Let nothing be a distraction. We give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Yes, um, we will begin. Um, so we kind of started looking at repentance last week. Uh, we looked at the Greek word for that. Uh, so we kind of looked at what repentance means as far as the you know Bible teaching is concerned regarding that particular word. Uh, we also saw how it applies to believers. Uh, and you know uh, how important it is uh, for us to first repent because from there uh, god is able to lead us into um, you know greater areas of holiness so that's like the beginning point of salvation it's also the beginning point of um, growth into the things of god so we just kind of had a introduction on repentance uh, today we will uh, you know look maybe in greater detail at the process of repentance what exactly is involved in this whole uh, act of repentance you know how do we display repentance on a daily basis as believers in our christian walk so um, we look at different aspects of that and um, the last session was based on the first six chapters of your repentance section uh, so today we'll try to get through the other uh, you know six chapters and you know if you've gone through the notes you would have observed that when i say chapters i don't i'm not really looking at thinking about you know um lengthy chapters some of the chapters in fact are like, like maybe about half a page or so uh, it's just maybe we could say there are six different uh, thoughts on repentance uh, so we covered the first six today we will be looking at the other six um aspects of repentance uh, most of them to do with the process of repentance um, uh, how do believers actually demonstrate repentance on a daily basis so that's basically what we would be uh, looking at today uh, so before we get into the subject as such uh, you know we are kind of um, halfway through the course already um, so we had an introduction to holiness and we looked at the importance of holiness in our own lives um, and then we kind of moved into repentance to you know see the important role that repentance plays uh, in living a holy life on a daily basis so uh, those two make up the first you know large chunk of this topic so um, next session onwards we would be looking at the overcoming life um, because a person who's living in spiritual failure can never really be holy so uh, it's all about uh, overcoming you know the world the flesh overcoming the evil one and uh, learning how to you know live in victory on a daily basis um, because it says in revelation that those who are you know able to overcome and live vic live in victory they are the ones who will be given white garments, you know, to uh, to wear and walk along with him. Uh, so, uh, because we also have the scripture which says that without holiness, you cannot even see God. Uh, so, um, it's all very vital, you know, for our um, eternal future. Uh, so, we will be looking uh, in the rest of our sessions at different aspects of the overcoming life, uh, how to overcome. Uh, sin and temptation in the world and uh, live in victory. 
So we are kind of at the halfway mark right now after, you know, um, almost finishing off the first section. Uh, so, so the next main section will be the overcoming vic victorious life. Uh, so at this point, we will have, um, you know, midterm assessment. Um, so um, sometime during this week, I will try to, you know, post it. Um, and um, uh, yeah, uh, OK, I really hope uh, that you're able to hear me better now. Um, as far as I can see here, the volume seems to be on full. So I am assuming it should be clear. OK, the, that, that's really yeah, good. I can't hear yeah. now. Perfect. All right. Uh, yeah. Um, so yes, uh, I, I'll you know sometime during this week, definitely before Saturday, uh, you know, by by the end of this week, I will post the uh, midterm assessment. So you will find that in your you know Google Classroom. And uh, like I had said, it it is basically multiple choice questions. So you just need to tick the correct answer. And there would be 50 of them. Um, and you know, you can look at your notes, you can go back to the videos. Um, you know, as long as you don't consult each other, you know, in um, finding out the answers, um, anything else is all right. Because you are allowed to, you know, consult your Bible, you are allowed to look at your notes, you are allowed to go through the videos, uh, because these uh, this assessment is more like a revision. And it's just kind of, um, you know, to help you assess how well you have grasped what has been taught so far. Um, so uh, you you don't have to like you know finish it at one go. You can you know, come back to the questions again and again and do it at your own pace. But of course, the one condition you know which is there is that once you click on an answer, you will not have a second time to reattempt that. So uh, once you answer, you answer. Uh, so you cannot change your answer after having chosen one particular you know, option. Uh, so the same thing would also be put on the e-platform for those who would be uh, you know, uh, attempting it uh, online through the e-platform. Uh, so my hope is that by Saturday, by the end of this week, uh, the whole thing will be up and uh, you, know, you will be able to do that. Uh, there'll be more than enough time to do it because I'm not very particular when you do it, uh, as long as it, it gets done before the you know uh, this semester closes. Because of course, once the semester closes, you know no one is allowed to submit after that. Uh, so I'll just kind of maybe keep the time limit as maybe two weeks or three weeks or something, and uh, you know you can try working on the uh, multiple choice questions during that time period. All right, so. Um, Let's get back to repentance. And uh, we'll begin with the chapter which talks about uh, what leads a person to repentance. We see there are some main things which help us um, and cause us, you know, motivate us to repent. And I have noticed that usually it is the love of God, the goodness of God, which brings us to repentance. Uh, I have noticed that again and again in my life. Um, a fear of rip, uh, fear of punishment um, does make us, you know, repent uh, because I mean uh, we don't want to be punished by the Lord. We don't want to lose out on blessings, and uh, all of that does act as a motivating factor. But I've noticed that it tends to be very temporary. You know, you may be scared of the punishment of God for a few days, and then the fear of that goes away, and then you know you get back to your um, normal. Uh, you know, compromising attitude. Um, it's the same with even, you know, uh, um, being worried about losing the blessings of God. Uh, that may, you know, drive you to um, observe, uh, you know, the, the, the laws of the Lord uh, very sincerely for a while. Uh, but then after you have received the answer to your prayer, you know, um, there's a tendency to again go back to um, a, a state of um, uh, substandard Christian living. So all of that is there. Uh, so I've noticed that more than um, you know, the fear of punishment or a desire to uh, get blessings, uh, it is the goodness of God, his love, his compassion, which more than anything else um, makes us repent. 
when we uh, sin, uh, we are convicted on the inside by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit reminds us of how loving he has been towards us and how patient he has been with us you know, um, over the years. And he says, even now, in spite of what you have done, you know, you can still come back to me and I'm still willing to build your life. So do you want to waste your life or do you want to come back? And, you know, that really draws us back. So I have noticed that more than anything else, it's his love. It's his compassion. It's this sheer goodness that he has towards me that makes me want to repent. It makes me want to live for him. It makes me want to honor him uh, because he is so kind and good. Uh, so uh, I think one of the chief factors which leads a person to repentance is the goodness of God. And, uh, you know, Romans chapter 2, verse 4 touches upon that, in fact. Uh, so um, if, if we could have one someone read out Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Romans chapter 2 verse 4. Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? Yeah. Uh, so here, you know, in the NIV, it says, uh, do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness? So when the Lord is being kind and compassionate and is willing again and again to give us a second chance, um, we are not meant to treat him with contempt and say, ah, OK, he'll anyway forgive again next time. So no harm in sinning once more. And then, you know, the next day you say to yourself, yeah, I know once again I can sin because he will forgive anyway. That is basically showing contempt for his uh, kindness rather than being touched by it and rather than being melted by his love. Uh, you know, we if we develop that um, that kind of um, casual business-like attitude, you know, of saying, ah, I can always come back to him. He'll anyway accept me. There's no love in that. There's only contempt towards him and what he is so, um, you know, uh, freely offering to us. So uh, in uh, Romans, Paul says, when God is, you know, uh, giving you the riches of his kindness, don't treat that with contempt rather realize that he's waiting, hoping that you will still give a chance to him to build your life. Because that's all it's about, right? I mean, if you can just come to him and submit to him, then he can make you Christ-like. He can help you to fulfill all the purposes that he has planned for your life. And he can give you the reward which he longs to give you. So um, he already has an eternal reward with your name on it. And he wants you to uh, step into the fullness of it, not miss out on even one aspect of this amazing reward that he has. Uh, and so all that he does, everything he does is aimed at that, you know, to help you to, um, to change yourself, to help you to become more like him, uh, to be able to, um, uh, to, to be able to, you know, in a very, in a very satisfactory manner, accomplish all the things that he has planned out for your life. All this so that on that day he can very proudly say, you know, to the father, "Look, I have brought this person before you, and I have brought, and I'm presenting them blameless, and they have done nothing but glorify you on the earth." You know, so he 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 just wants to take that. He wants to have the joy of presenting you in that way uh, before the father. Uh, so it's all intended for our good, and uh, so god's kindness is intended to lead us to repentance is what it says in romans chapter 2 verse 4 um one lovely example that we see you know in the gospels of how um, god's compassion and kindness uh, brought a person to repentance uh, that would be the story of zacchaeus uh, now we have many parables in the New Testament, but this is no parable. This is a real historical event of an actual person who lived in those times. And uh, this is his story. And um, there's a very wrong impression in Christian circles regarding Zacchaeus. Uh, just because of that one verse, you know, Luke 19, verse 7, 
where it says where the people you know they they mutter and they say he has gone to be the guest of a sinner and so just because that word sinner is used over there people have all this um, horrific pictures in their mind of uh, zacchaeus being this really terrible uh, unpleasant character who went around uh, you know oppressing people and uh, stealing from them and all of that uh, but uh, if you look at the actual wording over here you know in the story you know when zacchaeus makes his statement of repentance he says you know if i have cheated anybody out of anything i will pay back four times the amount he is not saying that he was a person who was always going around being evil and being crooked he says if at all by you know mistake i have done something crooked if at all by mistake you know i have deprived someone of what is actually theirs and i took more from them than the amount of taxes i was supposed to take if such a thing has happened you know i am willing to pay back four times and um, he also says that you know he will be giving away half of his possessions to the poor uh, so um i don't think this was an evil man at all uh, he is a man who i think loved the things of god which is why he was uh, eager to meet jesus which is why he takes the effort of actually climbing on a tree just to be able to catch a glimpse of him and so he is deeply and so he is deeply honored uh, when uh, you know uh, jesus says that i will come and you know stay at your house today and uh, in verse 6 Luke 19 verse 6 it says so he came down at once and welcomed him gladly uh, now um, the greek word used over there is the word rejoicing he rejoiced that jesus was willing to come to his house and you know be his personal guest so it was um, so while people looked down on him and mocked him uh, and, and and labeled him a sinner jesus on the other hand uh, you know recognized who he was and the eagerness that he had in inside his heart for godly things and uh, so jesus did not treat him the way uh, the other people treated him so uh, the this misconception regarding zacchaeus basically developed over the centuries because earlier people were not very familiar with uh, you know the the culture of um, the, uh, the of the you know jewish people and uh, the background of those times gradually even as archaeological findings increased gradually as people's knowledge of uh, the you know those times and the way people lived at that time and even as they went through all this you know secular writings that were written in, in those days and they got to kind of understand the culture of the people of those times they realized that this term sinner was reserved for people who are not observing the jewish rituals you know all these uh, rituals which the pharisees and sadducees had introduced you know purification rituals rituals to show how godly you are um, you know i mean uh, um, you know if you're wearing those those things which they attach to their hair with bible verses you know if you attached a lot of them to your hair it means that you're more godly so the term sinner was given to people who are not really observing all of those uh jewish rituals the term sinner was also given especially to tax collectors because you see they are uh, partnering with the romans in in imposing taxes upon their own people and uh, so that was something which a lot of people felt very upset about they were like look at these people they are our fellow uh, you know jews they are fellow israelites but um they have chosen to partner with the romans and now they are taking taxes from us their own people so uh, so they definitely must be labeled as sinners okay so uh, the term sinner was mainly used for people who were um, not living according to all the jewish rituals which you know the the leaders had imposed and sinners were also the people who were directly partnering with the romans in different capacities uh, so which is why jesus never bothered with these you know labels he freely moved around with all categories of people and uh, so he began to be known as the friend of sinners you know because he um, he he never uh, you know encouraged or supported the sinful things that any of them were doing 
but he knew also why they had been labeled in that way so uh, he did not discriminate against them in the way the leadership of that day was discriminating against them so um, zacchaeus i believe personally was in no way more sinful than other people um, he obviously would have had his own sinful attitudes and so when jesus comes to his house to be his guest uh, he is so touched by this by this act of love that uh, you know that jesus is showing him exclusively and uh, so he says you know in if you were to look at luke chapter 19 verses 7 and 8 um, the people are muttering and saying he has gone to be the guest of a sinner on the other hand if you know it zacchaeus he stands up and he says to the lord look lord here and now i give half of my possessions to the poor and if i have cheated anybody out of anything i will pay back four times the amount if zacchaeus had been a crook if he had been cheating people all along then this would be empty words just an empty statement the way our politicians make empty statements um you know because um after giving away half of his possessions to the poor he obviously would not have enough wealth left over uh, to give back to the people that he has cheated to give them give them back four times the amount it's just i mean the maths doesn't work out you know so um this is not a man who has been going around cheating people but now uh, out of his great wealth he's willing to give away half of it to the poor and with other half which is left he intends to you know run his household and you know, look after his family and in that half which is now left if at all he has cheated anyone you know uh, then he is willing to restore that four times to them uh, so when when he when uh, he speaks up in this way jesus responds by saying today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of abraham uh, so what exactly is it that zacchaeus has done over here um, that is that has made Jesus so happy. Uh, why does Jesus say, today salvation has come to this house? What is this act of repentance which Zacchaeus is supposed to have performed that impressed Jesus so much? To get a clearer understanding of this, of what Zacchaeus has just now done, uh, you know, we kind of need to contrast him with a rich young ruler of Mark chapter 10. And then we kind of begin to understand the greatness, um, the vastness of what Zacchaeus did. And the reason that we're getting into so much detail, uh, you know, um, into all of this is because we learn a very important lesson on repentance through this. Okay, so we are leading up to that. Um, so uh, just so that we can understand Zacchaeus' uh, repentance better, Let's take a very brief look at this rich young ruler who's mentioned in Mark chapter 10. Uh, if we can have someone read out uh, Mark 10, 18 to 23. Mark 10, 18 to 23, please. Um, okay, fine. Yeah, I mean, it's like a rather lengthy thing. I mean, leave, let's leave that. You know, um, uh, uh, 18 and 19, you know, basically is where Jesus tells him, uh, you know, these are the things that you would need to do, uh, you know, to, uh, to to please the Lord. And so he says, these are the commandments. You should not murder. You should not commit adultery and all of that. And this man uh, very confidently in verse 20, Mark 10, verse 20, he says, Teacher, all these I have kept since I was a boy. And um, then you have uh, Jesus' response. Jesus looked at him and loved him. Here was a man who genuinely cared about the things of God. So when Jesus looks at him, he loves him. In the same way he felt love towards Zacchaeus, he feels love towards this man. And he says, there's, there's still one thing you lack. And he says, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. So the key over here, the key phrase over here is that you will have treasure in heaven. Um, Zacchaeus was so honored by Jesus coming to his home and sh showing him love that he realized, you know, um, if I'm going to follow Jesus, 
and if i am going to get the kingdom because you know, jesus kept we kept uh, preaching everywhere right that the kingdom has come the kingdom is near and so repent so uh, he realizes that he can be part of the heavenly kingdom if he becomes a follower of jesus and so he without even jesus asking he begins to show christ likeness he says i i'm a very wealthy man so i am willing to give away half of my wealth to the poor because this man isaacus dependence is not at all on his wealth you see he is um, more interested in heavenly treasures jesus is going around preaching the kingdom of god and that fascinates him he wants to be part of that kingdom so in his eyes the wealth is not very important and so without even jesus having to prompt him on his own he gets up and he announces and says look lord you know i want to give away half of my wealth you know because he is longing for the spiritual treasures which are going to become his when he becomes when he and his family become followers of jesus christ uh, now over here in this case jesus observes that this rich young ruler doesn't quite have that same attitude he loves the things of god he has made an effort to live a godly life but um he he values the things of the world more than the things of god that is still there and jesus sees this lack in him and so he says you know uh, sell everything that you have everything that you have give it away uh, give it to the poor and i will make sure that you have a great treasure in heaven so uh, which means you know the that this person would have to start now depending on god to provide for his needs to provide for his family and he is not willing to take a step like that uh, his attitude is probably can god be trusted to that extent it's nice to honor god it's nice to obey him but my goodness having to completely trust god to that extent and rejoice over heavenly riches to that extent that is not something that this man was willing to do and so it says um, you know when jesus says those words to him in verse 22 Mark chapter ten verse twenty two it says, "At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth." And immediately after this, Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, "It says over here, this is what he says: How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. They have tasted the wealth and the power and the influence and the status of this life." of what this world has to offer and it is so overwhelming that they love it more than spiritual things so um true repentance would involve having to you know give up these things to pursue god because when we say you know i i choose to you know submit to you jesus as you know and accept you as my master and lord um he will start cutting off all those things you know which are causing spiritual lack in your life because that's what happened over here with the rich young ruler jesus looked into his heart saw his sincerity loved him and saw that he is still lacking in one very very important thing he values the things of the world more than the things of god and so jesus attacks that point you know that point of weakness and he says you know there's a way to mend this if you can get rid of um, this worldly wealth which is like you know dragging you down i will make sure you know that i'll rebuild a new life for you because later on if you look at the same passage you know jesus assures his disciples you know those who have given up so much for me i will take care of them both in this world and in the next you know um I, i will give them many houses and mothers and fathers and all of that you know so it goes on to say all of those things in that passage so jesus is not attempting to destroy the person's life but he's willing to build them a new one a new one in which the priorities would be right and where god can make that person uh, very rich spiritually and as far as the things of the earth are concerned god will sustain take care provide Uh, because like it says in matthew chapter 6 he knows exactly how to take care of his own okay so they don't have to be like starving or living in lack except maybe for one, for a temporary season during which time god would want to teach them you know some some lessons um so we see that um 
Zacchaeus repentance is the recognition that the things of this world are not of as much value as eternal things. So Zacchaeus longing was for the kingdom of God, that he and his entire household must be secure in God's eternal kingdom, where they would be members of that, you know, that kingdom. And uh, so that longing made him take the things of the earth very, very lightly. And he was willing to just give it away. And in case he has done any wrong, he's more than willing to, you know, uh, uh, reimburse four times uh, because now these things don't really matter so much. Um, the king of the kingdom has come to his house to dine with him. You know, the very king, the king of kings of this kingdom has come to his home to dine with him. And compared to that, compared to having his presence, compared to having his approval, what do other things even matter? So Zacchaeus had this amazing attitude of repentance. Now you and I, do we carry that kind of a you know attitude? Or are we still very, very attached to the things of the world? Uh, what comes first for us, you know, in our, at the bottom of our hearts, deep down in, in our hearts, what comes first? Uh, the things of God or the things of the world? If we still have a longing and an, and an attachment towards worldly things, you know, um, it's never ever a good thing to hide these things from God because God anyway knows what's going on at the bottom of our hearts. It's, it's better to just simply frankly go to him and say, Lord, this is where I am at. Right now I can see that I'm more like the rich young ruler than Zacchaeus. But Lord, I really don't want to lose out on your kingdom. I really don't want to lose out on, on, on your presence and pleasing you. So Lord, you help me to start getting rid of this horrible, horrible attitude of mine. And if you just go to him and humble yourself before him and admit the rot that is there in your heart and say, Lord, because that's what repentance is all about, right? You frankly admit that this is where I am at right now. And I know that this is disgusting and I really want to change. I'm not able to do it on my own. You help me, Lord, to do it by your power, by your strength, by your you know enabling of your Holy Spirit. The Lord will do that for us uh, because we are never meant to live out this Christian life on our own. It is impossible to live the Christian life in our human strength. It is always meant to be lived out in the power of the Holy Spirit. So it's not something that we can do on our own. So it is so good when we see this kind of you know wrong attitudes in our heart to just go to him very frankly and say, Lord, I'm shocked. I look at myself and I realize that I still love the things of the world more than I love the things of God. So, oh Lord, I really want those treasures of mine to be in heaven, not here, you know, where they are so temporary. I want my priorities to be pleasing you rather than just pleasing myself, pleasing my ambition, you know, pleasing uh, the people around me. Uh, so, you know, you, you, so repentance is all about starting to get your priorities right. Uh, uh, that is that is in fact one of the most fundamental first few uh, first few steps that you take, you know, in your um, walk of repentance. And uh, so Zacchaeus caught that. He, I think, maybe the man who had always been eager for godly things. So he, when when Jesus walked into his home, that was like the 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 last, you know, the last bit of a spark that he needed to just you know propel him into the kingdom of god and uh, so that happens for zacchaeus and um, we see other you know scriptures also which convey the very same message um, matthew chapter 13 verses 45 and 46 if someone could read out for us please matthew 13 45 and 46 Matthew chapter 13, verse 45 and 46. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Okay, so uh, this merchant who was, you know, um, a purchaser of pearls, he was a trader in pearls, he's looking for the finest uh, quality pearls available. And he comes across one which is so amazingly valuable that he is willing to sell everything that he has 
just to be able to acquire it. Uh, so you see, he valued that pearl that much. So Jesus is saying the kingdom of heaven is like that. How many of you really value the kingdom to, to an extent where you are willing to sacrifice everything for that? To get, to get into that kingdom, to be a part of it, you know, to gain citizenship in that. How many of you long for the kingdom of heaven to that extent? You know, is is basically the question which Jesus is posing. You know, when he gives, when he uses this particular, uh, you know, comparison, uh, when he compares the kingdom of heaven to a merchant who sold everything just to be able to get that one pearl, because to him that pearl was that valuable. So it's like Jesus is saying, "Is my kingdom that valuable to you?" And if we do not have that attitude, it would really help to honestly go to him, humble ourselves before him, before him and say, Lord, I repent of this wrong attitude that I have, where are the things of the world are more important to me. I don't want to be like this. Please help me. Please change me. And then and you choose to start changing your priorities. And even as God leads you to you know, give up certain things, uh, to cut down your the amount of time that you spend on certain things, you choose to be willing. You choose to follow whatever he is telling you to do. And as you do it, then um, you know, your spiritual riches will start increasing uh, in your you know, heavenly bank account. And in the meantime, you, you here on this earth will start becoming more holy and you'll start becoming more like Christ. Uh, so um, the people of the world, you know, when they look at us, they probably think that we are so foolish. Why are we giving up on so many things? Why are we making so many sacrifices? They just don't get it. They think just for the sake of being spiritual, why are these people giving up these things? They don't understand that we are doing this because we have we are preparing ourselves for an amazing kingdom, an eternal kingdom for in immensely great riches. They think we are just giving up everything to just be paupers. But no, we are actually giving up everything because we have caught hold of this pearl of, you know, which is beyond all value. And to get that pearl, to have access to that pearl, we are willing to give up everything else. Uh, so, um, uh, so the world doesn't get why we are doing this, but we are wise people who are doing this because we have caught hold of something that is just too valuable to let go of. It would be heights of foolishness to let go of this amazing kingdom of heaven, uh, to, to let go of this God who is so compassionate, so loving, so humble, I mean, even though he's almighty, he is so humble. To give up someone like that, what foolishness that would be, you know? So, um, which is why, you know, we 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 give up the other things so that we can hold on to him, uh, so that we can, you know, uh, uh, please him and honor him. And we see the same thing even about, uh, um, you know, Moses as well. Uh, if someone could read out Hebrews chapter 11, Verses 25 to 27. Hebrews 11, 25 to 27, please. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 25 to 27. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Yeah, so it talks about Moses and says, rather than enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin the very temporary pleasures of sin rather than enjoying that he chose to be mistreated with the people of god and it says he chose disgrace you know he preferred to suffer disgrace um, for the sake of the kingdom of god because he was looking ahead to his reward it says in hebrews 11:26 he was looking ahead to his reward and it says in verse 27, he continued to persevere because his eyes were set upon the invisible. His eyes were set upon the Lord. 
he cannot see the lord physically but he knows that the lord is there and if he holds on to the lord the lord will lead him into an eternal kingdom you know and he will always be there in the presence of god so knowing that he was willing to you know uh, sacrifice everything else so you know um, this is one major learning in this whole uh, thing subject of uh, repentance we have to come stage by stage uh, to a place where god is everything for us the kingdom of god is everything for us and uh, all these other things are no longer as valuable so if the lord says to give up something we will be more than willing to do that uh, because we are pursuing something which is of amazing value so in all our acts of repentance the different things that you know we would be giving up on a, on a daily basis uh, it, it we are doing it all with this goal that we are reaching out to something that is of absolute value that is something that is eternal and so for the sake of that we undergo this process of repentance and it's the love of god which kind of you know gives us the motivation and the encouragement to um, to pursue because we see how loving he is we see the great promises that he is making to us and we choose to trust him we choose to believe him and out of our faith you know out of this childlike faith which we have started to place in him we are willing to give up other things because we know he'll take care we know that he will provide we know that he will reward so he becomes the focus you know he becomes the central focus uh, there's another uh, thing that can lead us to repentance and that is the works and the miracles of god which lead us to repentance um if we can have someone read out matthew chapter 11 verses 20 and 21 matthew 11 20 and 21 Matthew 11, 20 and 21. <clears throat> then he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done, because they did not repent. O to you, Chorazin, O to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which you had done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Amen. You know, it's what it does, the Lord says over here. He says, the miracles which I have done for you people... If I had done it back then in those days, entire Tyre and Sidon would have repented right then and there because they would have seen that I am indeed divine. They would have seen that I am indeed God and that what I am speaking is the truth and they would have repented. But here you are after seeing all that you are seeing with your own eyes, you're still refusing to you know, place your trust in me. You're refusing to submit to me. Uh, on the other hand, you know, when we look at Peter, Peter, when he saw the miracle that was taking place in front of his eyes, his immediate response was, you know, uh, that would be in your Luke chapter 5, verses 6 to 11. Luke chapter 5, verses 6 to 11, where, uh, you know, they catch such a huge number of fish after having, you know, fished the entire night and not caught anything. So Peter very well knew that there were no fish over there earlier. Okay, they all very, very well know because they've been doing that the entire night, they very, very well, well know that there were no fish in the water earlier. Now, suddenly there are so many fish over there that the, the nets are breaking. And so when Peter sees this miracle, uh, his immediate response is repentance. Uh, unlike this hard-hearted people, you know, in Matthew chapter 11, Peter, when he sees a miracle, he immediately realizes that he is standing in the presence of divinity. He's standing in the presence of a very holy God. And so his immediate response is in Luke chapter 5, verse 8. He says, you know, he falls down at, at Jesus' feet and he says, go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. He is terrified. He's scared. Thing. How can something as unclean as me even be in the presence of such holiness? And so he says, Lord, please, if you don't go away, you know, I'll probably, you know, perish right here and, and die because of the sinful person that I am. And then look at Jesus' response to this act of repentance. It's so beautiful. In Luke chapter 5, verse 10, Jesus says to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So Jesus, you know, is saying, if you can just admit 
who you are how pathetic you are you know how sinful you are on the inside openly frankly humble yourself and admit the realities about uh, the depths of the evil in your heart if you can just be frank about it and confess it before me then i can start working on you to purify you from all of that unrighteousness you know that's what it says in first john um, chapter 1 verse 9 uh, uh, so uh, he we need to take that first step of admitting all the dirt there is very frankly when we do that and we cry out to him and say lord you have to help me i cannot get rid of this on my own then that gives the in uh, the opening to the lord to begin his work of transformation so jesus says you don't need to be afraid of me because i will train you up i will change and transform you so that you will start doing something amazing you start fishing for people and bringing them into the kingdom of god so forget about you being worried about whether you'll you know you get uh, destroyed by the wrath of god i will bring you into the kingdom not only will you come into the kingdom you in fact will have will be empowered to bring a lot of other people thousands of others into my kingdom that's the kind of trans work of transformation that i will do in your life and when these people these fishermen hear about this this is their response to what he is offering in verse 11 luke 5:11 so they pulled their boats up on shore left everything and followed him so they so this you know in the 40 minutes or so that we have spent we look at again and again that this idea of leaving everything because now they have found something of great value so first step very very first step to repentance look at ourselves we need to examine ourselves and ask ourselves in what areas are we still valuing the things of the world more than the things of god and those things have to be left behind we need to get rid of those wrong attitudes with the help of the holy spirit so the first step would be to admit that we are in that sinful place that we have those wrong attitudes and to reach out to him and say lord you help me and then god says to us don't be afraid i am going to rebuild you into a new person and give you a new purpose so the lord will do that and uh, so in gratitude we choose to continue leaving everything that is holding us down we continue to walk in him and that is basically what discipleship is all about you know so um yeah um and a, a third thing that leads people to repentance is godly sorrow okay so uh, maybe we can look at the scripture uh, which talks about godly sorrow second um, corinthians chapter 7 verses 9 and 10 if we could have someone read out please second corinthians 7 9 and 10 Second Corinthians seven nine and ten. Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you are made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. Amen. So yes, thank you so much. So here it says, you know, in Second Corinthians chapter seven verse nine. um your sorrow led you to repentance godly sorrow always leads to repentance and in verse 10 we see that godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret so when there is godly sorrow um that leads to genuine repentance and it it will lead to the salvation you know of your soul uh so the details of that uh, we we'll look at Uh, when we you know get get back from our break uh, but these are really vital lessons that we can learn there are some absolutely beautiful lessons that we can learn um, you know from the difference between godly sorrow and worldly sorrow if we can have godly sorrow in our hearts that can change our lives on the other hand we need to guard ourselves from worldly sorrow because that will just lead to nothing but despair and destruction 
that's from the devil so uh, let's look at the you know difference between those two things when we get back from our break uh, so if we can all log back in at 11 o'clock please all right thank you <laughs> 